I, uh, I've had a, a chance to hang out with some of your worship team here with Tony and Adrian and Amy, and I've talked to Pastor Juan a few times, and I'm the worship arts pastor out at Palm Valley Church in Goodyear, Arizona, and uh, man, when you pe- meet people that are just in it for the right reasons, that want to honor God and worship Him with all they have, I just get so encouraged by it, and I just want you to know that today as I walked into uh, Unleashed, I, uh, I was reminded of my own story. I, uh, I was far from God after college, and I, I had been in church my whole life, and my, my parents had raised me in a small little church, and I went to a Christian school, and, and uh, once I got to college and beyond, I started to really kind of take a left turn in my faith and in my walk with God, and uh, I was making some really bad decisions, and I was starting to do a lot of dumb stuff, and uh, I just want um, you to know that there was, a, there was an opportunity for me to actually go into a church. So my, my wife was praying for me. My brother was praying for me. My, uh, my parents were praying for me. And they invited me to this church. And I thought to myself, like, I just don't want to go back to church. I, I really, really wanted, I was trying to resist it as much as possible because I had kind of been burned. And I kind of had a bad taste in my mouth from the churches that I had been to. And I finally agreed to go to church. And I walked in, and it was in a movie theater out in Goodyear, Arizona. And uh, they were leasing a movie theater. And when I walked in, it smelled like popcorn. And I thought, okay, I can, I can kind of get used to this. This is cool. And there were movie posters on the, on the walls. And I thought, okay, this is different. This is different. And the people that were in the lobby that were around there greeting me and welcoming me were really, really fun and really cool. And they didn't take themselves too seriously. And I don't take myself very seriously, but I do take God very seriously. And, uh, and then I met a man who was just over the top, like personality, really fun, a little, a little edgy and so forth, and I really connected with him, and then I realized later on when I went into church that he actually went up to give the message, and I thought, okay, I like this church. I really like this church, and yesterday when I was able to tour here, Amy gave my wife and I a tour. Uh, I realized that this used to be a movie theater, and I just want to honor you and let you know that my life was changed in a movie theater so many years ago, and I know that there are so many more lives that can be changed through Unleash, and I'm sure there's a ton of stories of people that are here today, and maybe you're here for the first time, or maybe you've, you're still checking out church, you're not sure if it's for you. I just want you to know that you're in a safe place today. I hope this message speaks to you. Um, I hope that you understand that we love you, and that we are here for you, and God is here for all of us, and today we're going to talk about worship and how worship is a crucial part of our everyday life. You see, worship, all of us are designed and created to worship something. And so maybe you're here today and you're not even a follower of Christ yet. Or maybe you, you, uh, you don't really consider yourself to be a person that worships flamboyantly, right? We just listened to a really cool set about how Jesus fights the darkness. He overcomes it. And I get excited when I hear that. But we're all created to worship something. And we are, um, we are all are giving worth to different things in our life, and that is the form of worship it takes. So today I just want you to perhaps get a, a little bit more of a, a broader view of what worship truly is and how it plays out in our everyday life, okay? All right, let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for Unleashed Christian Church, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity we have, God, Lord, to just dive into what you've taught us about worship, God. Thank you for all that you're doing, Lord, through the lives of Every single person, Lord, that um, is uh, serving here, Lord, that is giving of their time and their talent and their treasure, Lord. Thank you, God, that um, we have this time appointed to us to dive into what you have for us, God. We love you, and it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. I grew up a huge Phoenix Suns fan. I played basketball my whole life, and it was really the only thing to do. We didn't have Wi-Fi. We didn't have cell phones or anything like that. So we had a basketball. We had something to do. And I was playing basketball all the time, and the Phoenix Suns were my team. And uh, the last service I brought up the Phoenix Suns and nobody cheered and nobody cheered this time. So I guess there's no Phoenix Suns fans in the house, <laughs> which is, all right, let's go. Yeah. And that's okay because I'll be, I will be the only Suns fan in here. That's cool. It's like, I'm used to it, man. I'm used to it. But the, uh, all right, U of A, let's go. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, anytime we could get tickets to a Suns game, I would go, right? And like, I can't think of any time that I've ever actually purchased Suns tickets, but I actually got invited to a lot of different um, t- uh, games. And so... When I, uh, when I got older and one of my buddies won a radio contest and we got the chance to actually sit courtside at a Suns game, and I was so excited. And the, uh, the team at the time, I'm going to give you a quick history lesson on the Suns, I'm sorry. 
But here's the deal. There was a time, an era where they were actually really, really good. They had Steve Nash and Amari Stoudemire. And Amari Stoudemire was like this awesome center that we had, and he was larger than life. But when we got the tickets, he was on the injured list. And so when, when, uh, when we were kind of being strategic in our thinking, my buddy and I, I thought, well, who, what are the odds that we're going to be able to get anybody's autograph? And we thought, well, Amari Stoudemire is probably the, the guy that we're going to be able to get his autograph because he's not playing tonight. And so we bought a jersey, Amari Stoudemire jersey, pay, way, paid way too much for it, but it's okay. We had a Sharpie with us, and I was sitting there courtside, and my buddy had actually got escorted into center court because they were making an announcement or something like that with him. And who, who else but Amari Stoudemire walks in, stands right in front of me with his back to me. And I'm sitting there thinking, jackpot. This is what I signed up for. This is going to be worth it. And so I work up the courage to call out to Amari Stoudemire, and I say, Amari, and he turns around, and he makes eye contact with me. And in that moment, I have no idea what happened. I lost my mind. Like, I did not expect this to happen, but my heart rate went up. My palms were sweaty. I started to kind of freak out. I couldn't get two words out together. I didn't know what to say. I was kind of overwhelmed in the moment. I was kind of embarrassed. But I think Amari was really used to it because he just kind of looked at me, and he just, he just does this. I'm like, so I give him the jersey and the, and the Sharpie, and he signs the jersey, gives it to me. He turns around, and I'm like, thank the Lord, transaction complete. I survived that whole situation there. And so he's standing there for a minute there, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, he's not going anywhere. What else can I get out of this guy? Like, I brought a digital camera with me at the time, and we didn't have cell phones. Remember, I'd mentioned that before. So we had these old school, like, digital cameras, which at the time were, like, state of the art. But my buddy wasn't sitting next to me. He was out still in the half court, whatever they were doing with him, making an announcement that he called into a radio station. Congratulations, you're awesome. But I was sitting there, and sure enough, this guy behind me, who I didn't even realize was there, tapped me on the shoulder. And I look back, and he says, hey, man, I will take your picture of you and Amari. Just give me your camera. Ask him. You got to do this. It was kind of like he was reading my mind. And so I thought, I'm going to do this. I give the guy my camera, give him a, a quick, like, turn it on for him. And I reach back up to Amari, and I'm like, Amari, Amari, and he finally turns around, he gives me a look, and I'm like, and the same thing happens to me, I kind of panic a little bit, but I'm like, can I, can I just get a picture with you, and he's just, sure enough, he does this, by the way, he didn't mention one word to me, he just kind of did a lot of hand motions and things like that, he says, come on up, I stand next to him, and this guy that was behind me had the camera out, and I realized in that moment, when we were both looking at my friend, my new friend, that he had the same exact response that I did just a few minutes before. He was in total panic mode. He did not know how to use a camera. I'm sure he didn't even realize what a camera was in that moment. And he was freaking out. And it got to a point where he actually had the camera pointed at his own face. And I could see his nose and his mouth in the display screen while Lamari Stoudemire is standing next to me. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a PR rep, one of his reps, coming over to rescue this this athlete from these two crazy people that keep bothering him. And I'm like, please take the picture. And in that moment, I'm giving him the universal sign for how to take a picture. And this is what the picture ended up looking like. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So let me just tell you, like this is before memes were a thing, but like if that got out nowadays, that would be a horrible meme. So please don't send that out, Adrian. Do me a favor, man. But the reason I bring up that story was in that moment, when I was faced with quote unquote greatness, right? One of the best athletes out there, somebody I looked up to, somebody who was the star of a team that I loved, somebody who was six foot 10, somebody that was a multimillionaire, was, had millions of fans. When I finally interacted with him, when I, was, when I encountered him, my response to him was one of being completely overwhelmed where I couldn't even get words out. My heart rate went up and I didn't know what to do. And you see, that's actually a glimpse of what actual worship really is. See, the word in the Bible used for worship means to fall down on your face before God in all his glory. And see, I had a, I had a, a miniature version of this with a, with a famous celebrity in the moment. But when I think about all the things that God has done for me and who he truly is, how much more should I respond to him in that moment? We just sang a song that talked about how Jesus is the light of the world, right? He overcomes darkness. He conquers fear. There's verses in the Bible that talk about how there are a hundred million angels standing before God right now singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And in that same person is the one that wants to relate with me. And so when I think about that, I literally get chills to think, how do I respond to a real God, to the true God? And so today we're going to be talking about true worship and what that means. Let me pray for us. 
God, we lift you up again. Lord, uh, we cannot pray enough to you. We cannot give you enough glory and enough honor, Lord. Praying to you is a form of worship, Lord. And I pray that today, Lord, that you would um, reveal yourself to us, God. Thank you again, Lord, for allowing us to come to, into your presence, Lord, no matter what way it takes, Lord, what, um, what format we speak to you, Lord, in what way that we engage with you, Lord, whether it's through singing or whether it's through our time or through our talent, Lord, we love you, God. We give you praise again, God. Um, Romans 12, 1 through 2 says this. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You see, when you read through this scripture, it's basically talking about how we are to respond to God. It starts out by saying that in order to um, honor God, we have to be a living and holy sacrifice. So it says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. That word because is our response. Because of all he has done for us, he wants us to be a living and holy sacrifice. You know, that word sacrifice means something different to all of us. For those of you that are parents, um, sacrifice comes really easy, right? We can think of a million examples of how we have sacrificed for our kids, right? It could be sacrificing that last cookie that we really, really want, but our kid really wants it, and you just give it to them anyways, right? Or it could be as far as saying, I would take a bullet for my kid. I would sacrifice my life for my kid. Why? Because you love them so much, because they mean so much to you. When you attribute worth to something, it's easy to sacrifice for it. Well, God has called us to do the same thing and to sacrifice that which is most valuable to us. And we are supposed to give him the first and the best of that which is most valuable to us. We'll read in Deuteronomy 26.10, it says this. It says, And now, O Lord, I have brought you the first portion of the harvest you have given me from the ground. Then place the produce before the Lord our God and bow to the ground in worship before him. You see, God deserves our very first and our best, the first portion, not the scraps. I think about when, uh, when you get invited somewhere, and, and it, so many times when uh, my, my, my nephew and uh, my uh, niece-to-be are getting married, and they're going through their invite list right now, and I look through that list, and they only have so many seats available, and as you start getting down to the bottom of the list, I start to think, man, if those people only knew they were number 48 and 49 on this list, they were not the first on the list, and God wants to be the first on that list as well. He deserves nothing less. Well, one area that we can sacrifice to him, something that is extremely valuable, especially something that I consider really valuable in my life, is our time, right? Time is crucial. We can sacrifice our time, but it is incredibly valuable. One of the biggest reasons is because we cannot replenish our time. We can't extend our time. We can't buy more time. So when we give our time, it is something that honors God because of how valuable it is. He has given us our the time that we have here on earth, and he asks us to give it back to him. In fact, in scripture, it says in James, it says, look here, you who say today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and will stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Essentially, what that scripture is saying is that our time is limited. We cannot predict what the future holds for us. God has given us this blessing in time, and he asks us to give it back to him. Now, one of the reasons I struggle with this the most is it's just part of my personality, and it sounds kind of like an excuse to make, but it's, it's over the years in my career before I became a pastor, I was always interviewing people, and we would always give people personality tests to kind of get a gauge of what motivates people. And one of the most recent tests I took, it actually literally said this about me. I got to read this. It kind of hit me right in between the, in the eyes. It says, it says, I am greedy with my time and energy, and even goes as far to say that I feel compelled to hoard my time and energy. I definitely have a problem with this. And I think the word, like the hoarding thing is kind of like come into full focus right over the last year as so many people were buying way too much toilet paper, buying way too, too many paper towels. And even nowadays when we see with this gas shortage in the East Coast, you see people filling up 
buckets of gas because they're trying to hoard this thing. And I think sometimes in our lives, especially in mine, I try to hoard my time. I think of the times that somebody invites me to their house and it takes me two or three days to respond to them because I want to make sure that there's nothing better to do and that I really, really want to commit to going to see my friend or my family for a couple of hours. It's kind of ridiculous, but that's kind of how my brain works as well. And I wonder if any of you struggle with that as well, to give up your time and to commit to it. Um, some of the ways that we can give God our time is to just spend time with him. And that sounds really like simple, right? Well, I can give you an example. Uh, my mom passed away a couple of years ago and my dad's getting up in years. And uh, towards the end of my mom's life, I always, anytime that I went to, to see her, I would always try to go in with like an agenda. Like I wanted to, f- like, what did you want to do, mom? Where do you want to go? Um, what do you want to talk about? Is there anything that I can bring you? And by the time my mom passed, I realized that all she wanted to do was spend time with me. Same with my dad. I, as I visit him now, he, he just wants to be with me. And I think in a lot of ways, God is the same way. He just wants us to be with him. He says in his word to be still and know that I am God. And in many ways, we can just spend time with him. And there's different ways to do that. Me personally, I I just meditate on God. I'll listen to some worship music and I'll just think about all the goodness and all the holiness and all the love that he has given to me and I'll spend time with him in that way. Another really crucial way is to spend time in his word. And I know maybe you haven't read through the word cover to cover and that's okay. There are so many resources out there to allow you to, to spend enough time to focus on what God is teaching you through his word. It's a true way to get to know him. And that's really crucial. Another way is to pray. My mom was a prayer warrior. My brother is a prayer warrior. He's actually a pastor over prayer at our church. And that's a great way to spend time with him. And so the challenge today is to spend, to give God the first and best of your time because it is so valuable. Another area that we can give God that is incredibly valuable is with our talent. Now, talent is kind of like a, a, a broad stroke, right? We just listen to a really, really good worship team sing songs, and it's really obvious what their talent is. When you see Pastor Juan up here speaking, and I watched a lot of his messages over the last week, he has a gift of communication. He also has a really big gift of energy, and uh, I just felt like I needed to drink like three or four cups of coffee before I spoke today, but I didn't want to freak out up here, but he's definitely got that energy. But so many of us have gifts that maybe and talents that maybe aren't as obvious, right? Some of the biggest impacts in my life and in the lives of people that I know are given because um, somebody used a hidden talent that they had or a talent that wasn't in a public setting. I think of Rob, who I worked with for many years. He had the gift of encouragement. He would encourage me daily to, to get into my word, but he would, just, he would just pick me up. He was just an encouraging guy. And when I was down, he knew it. And he would come alongside me and pray with me or just actually hang out with me and, and, uh, and just let me know that he's, he is my friend and he's there for no other reason. Like I mentioned before, a talent of prayer. Some of you might have a a talent of hospitality. I love the people that have the talent of hospitality or the gift of hospitality. When I walked in today, I met a lot of you that had that gift. And I love being invited over to somebody's house that has that gift because I know that they're purposeful in the way that they present their home and the way that they select the food or actually in just what the night uh, entails is all because they're using their gift for God. And I appreciate it when people use that gift. Maybe you're really good with your hands and you build stuff and you can fix things. And maybe you can use that talent to honor God by blessing other people. And in hearing some of the stories already, I've only been here this morning. I've already heard so many stories of people blessing other people with their talents. And it, it's really encouraging to me. So the, the Bible says that Psalm 139 says this. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. And I read the scripture just letting you know that God perfectly designed you and he had your talent in mind when he created you in your mother's womb. He knew exactly what he wanted to give you. He knew how he wanted to shape you. He knew what talent he wanted to give you, what strengths to give you, and he wants you to use that for him. I think of some of the best gifts I've ever received were ones that were specifically designed for me. Like, I love gift cards, don't get me wrong. So if anyone wants to give me a gift card later, I'm down. But, 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 if you, but the gifts that come from my wife or from my kids even that, 
that are that show a little bit of thought into who I am and what I truly appreciate and what I love are the ones that mean the most to me. And that is what the talent is that God gave you. He knew what you needed and who you would be. And so when we use our talent for God, it is an honor to him and it is a form of worship. And the last area today that I want to talk about is that we can sacrifice our treasure. We can sacrifice our treasure. Amy just mentioned earlier how we have this match program going on right now at Unleashed. And there's, we're just a little bit short of the, of, the, um, of the goal. But that's a really good example of people that are trusting God with their treasure. And I, I find that talking about treasure usually is the one that gets a little bit uncomfortable, right? Our founding pastor at our church used to have this phrase. He used to say, people get funny when you talk about money. And it's totally true. And uh, we've seen that time and time again. And to me, as I look at the three things, time, talent, and treasure, time and talent are so much more valuable, right? They are, uh, they are things that are uniquely designed for us. And when I look at treasure, I think about it as more of a commodity, a means to an end. And uh, treasure is really hard and really difficult to give back to God for different reasons. And Jesus knew this. When Jesus was here on earth, throughout his ministry, throughout the recording of his ministry, he talked about treasure more than anything else. And there's a story in the Bible while Jesus was doing his ministry, while he was healing people, while he was declaring the good news, while he was um, showing people the way this rich young ruler came up to him. And I, and I kind of have a visual of this guy. He was, obviously he was wealthy. He was young and he was a person of influence. And uh, I kind of visualize him kind of walking up with a little bit of swag to Jesus. And he asked Jesus this question. He said, Jesus, how do I have eternal life? How can I get eternal life? knowing that Jesus could give him the correct answer to this question. How can I have eternal life? And I visualize him as kind of having, maybe having a little bit of dough in his pocket, maybe having some of his servants with him to, once Jesus told him what to do, maybe he could delegate it out and figure out how to make this transaction happen, right? How to have eternal life. The most important thing that there is. And Jesus, knowing his heart, I love that. Um, we just mentioned how Jesus, he created us in our mother's room, and so he knows everything about us, which means he knows our heart. He knows our motive. Jesus answers him, and he says, he kind of threw a softball out there to this guy, and he says, just follow the Ten Commandments. And immediately this guy's like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I haven't killed anybody lately, and I haven't, um, I haven't cheated on my wife. I haven't stolen anything. I'm good. I followed the Ten Commandments since I was a kid. And he answers Jesus with that, and Jesus says this, and I love these verses here talks about how Jesus knows our heart. And it says here, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Let's start with that. He felt genuine love for him. He wasn't punishing this man. He wasn't upset with this person. He loved him. And he knew that he would sacrifice himself for him later on. And he says this, there is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all of your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. See, Jesus wasn't implying that this man could buy his way into heaven. He wasn't demanding a price for salvation or for eternal life. He looked into this man's heart knowing exactly the one thing that this man would have the hardest time sacrificing for God. The one thing that he could not respond with in order to honor and truly worship God was his resources because he had so much of it. And it's so sad to see this man walk away in sadness, giving up eternal life that the Messiah, the Son of God, actually told him. And he left because he couldn't give that up. You know, my wife and I, we struggled in this area for a long time. We were married, and uh, I worked in a, a retail environment. I used to do sales, and I was just not that good of a sales guy. I'm just going to be honest with you. And uh, because it was commission-based, I kind of had a lot of up and ups and downs on, on the, the uh, commission and the, and the money. And the good thing was my wife was a, like a total baller. She was like always making it rain because she's a school teacher. And so, you know, school teachers make so, so much money and they get paid exactly what they should for their job. And uh, we, were, we weren't doing too hot financially. And we were, uh, at this time, we were totally involved in our church. We were giving up of our time. Like we were serving every single week on the worship team. Um, 
it's like 15 to 20 hours a week. So we were like giving like a part-time hours to, to just to serve. And we were given our talent, obviously, because we were, were gifted with in, in the music, in musical, um, in the music, 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 musical ways. How's that sound? Yeah. Not in, not in articulating thoughts, apparently. <laughs> but we were, we were giving our time and our talent to God every single week. And we were in a small group. And our small group was, uh, we, we had a lot of great friends in there, but not all of them were serving, but they all went to church. And inevitably, the conversation in small groups always went in a certain direction. They were, it always ended up with them talking about the new boat they were going to buy or the vacation they were going to go on or the upgrade they were going to make on their house or this and that because they, they had money. And Eileen and I would always kind of shut down during that time. And we would, um, this time was a little bit worse because right before we went to, to small group, we had received a, a bill that week um, in the mail, unexpected bill, it was like $800 bill. And we laugh now because that bill could have been $8 million or $8 billion. Either way, we couldn't pay it. And we were really stressed. And we had literally had around $40 in our bank account for the next couple of weeks. And so we were just really struggling. And I was really tired of borrowing money from my parents, even though they always left money on the table, and same with her parents, and this and that, and I remember driving home, and I was so upset, and, uh, and I've asked God for forgiveness in this, but I was actually really upset with him, and I've, I, I, used to, I remember asking him, God, we give, you give you so much of our time, we're always serving, we got into the comparison game between us and these other couples, like, they're not serving as much as us, they can't sing as well as I can. Like, what are they doing? Like, how come they have all this and we're, we're struggling so much? And it got to a point where we were just weeping and we were so upset about it. And uh, by the time we got home, our son, who was in the back seat, he was maybe a year or two old, and he, was, he finally fell asleep. And those of you parents know when your kid's cranky, sometimes we just get in the car and we drive around, right? And we just hope they, they fall asleep and we'll drive as long as it takes for them to fall asleep. And he finally fell asleep on the way home and we pull up in our driveway and it's really dark there. And I remember just weeping with my wife because we just didn't know what to do. We just didn't know what to do. And I remember hearing God's voice in that car and he said, why don't you start giving? Why don't you be obedient to me and actually do what I asked you to do by giving me your first and best of your finances? And a lot of times, whenever I've heard the voice of God, it sounds a lot like my wife. <laughs> and I look over at my wife and she actually spoke the truth in that moment. And, uh, and, and the verses we read, it says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, right? Like, go against what the world wants you to do. And I can think of a million reasons why, why would I start giving money when I had $40 in an account and I was in debt and I had $800 bill I didn't know what to do with. And we had a new baby that we had to buy formula for and all this. And the answer is to give money back to God. Like, that doesn't make any sense. But God designed math. He created math, and he can make math work how he wants. He just wants our heart. He wants us to show him value. And in that moment, Eileen and I knew it was the right answer, and so we, we committed to God in that moment. We didn't write a check. We didn't pull money out of the account. We just committed to God that we were going to do that in that moment. And we felt this peace wash over us, and this burden kind of lift from, from us, and, and we finally got out of the car, and we're exhausted. You know, like after you cry for a while and you're just like super tired and we're just like empty, right? And I get my son and taking him inside, trying not to wake him up. Eileen goes and gets the mail. And as she comes back in, we're both just kind of like mulling around and she's going through all the junk mail. And of course, we see something in there that looks like a bill. And I'm thinking to myself, great, let's like whatever, like th th you can add anything else to, to our expenses here. No problem. And something my wife always says since we started honoring God with our giving, it's like when you get a bill that is unexpected or unplanned, you just give it back to God because God has promised to provide for us. And so when that happens, you're like, God, how do I redirect? How do we talk to the post office to redirect this bill back to God? This is your problem now. I need you to fix my car. I'm on. I'm doing my part. And he always comes through. And when Eileen opened that letter and she looks in, she begins to cry again. And I'm thinking, great. This is like, all right, we got more, more to figure out. But in there was a refund check from some random place. It was just a little bit over the amount we owed. It was a little bit over $800. And in that moment, I knew that God was listening to us. He knew that we needed that moment. And I'm not here to tell you that if you start giving to the church or anything, you're going to get checks in the mail. Like, that is not something that I teach. I don't believe in that. That is not how it works. But I will tell you this. God will keep his promise to you. He will honor his promise to you to provide abundantly more than you could ever ask or imagine. And we have seen that happen throughout our entire life. And you see, 
One of the reasons God asks us to sacrifice for him is because he sacrificed so much for us. When he was talking to the rich young ruler in that moment, and he asked the rich young ruler to throw, sell all of his possessions and give everything back to God, he knew that within a year or so, he was going to be hanging on a cross, dying for that rich young ruler. Jesus knew that he was going to give everything for him. And he has given everything for us, and he deserves nothing less than what we can give him out of the, the stuff that is the most valuable to us. He deserves nothing less than the first and the best of what we have to offer, the most valuable things we have, our time, our talent, and our treasure. And I don't know what you struggle with today. I told you before, t time for me is the biggest one, and I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to honor God with that. Maybe you have a talent today that maybe you haven't used for God's glory yet. And you, you're able to do that. And I challenge you, get involved in church here. Get involved with your community and give your talent back to God. You only have it because of him. Or maybe it's treasure. And maybe you've really held on to that and you can't quite see how God's going to make it work. But I can tell you, he will make it work. He honors his promises to us. Uh, God is so good. And he deserves all the glory. And he deserves all the praise. And he deserves all of our treasure, our time, and our talents. And so I, I want to pray over you today. I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come on up, prepare for this last song. But I want to pray over you and, and just uh, encourage you in this area. God, thank you. Thank you for this church, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity we have, God. Thank you that we can come to you before you, Lord, as, uh, as, your, as your kids. Thank you, Lord, that you have always provided for us. Lord, thank you that you have always kept your promises to us, Lord. Lord, we're going to sing right now about breakthrough in our lives, God. We're going to declare that right now, Lord, that you will never stop, Lord. You will never stop loving us. You will never stop providing for us, Lord. Lord, your forgiveness is something that we are in awe of. Lord, I pray right now if somebody here today has not met you personally, Lord, Lord, they haven't given their life to you, God, and maybe they're on the fence and they're thinking through it. Maybe, Lord, this is all new to them. God, I pray for that person today, Lord, that they would, would speak to you, Lord that they would reach out to you, Lord, that they would stay after service today, Lord, and pray with us, God. Lord, we, we want people to meet you, God. I pray for anyone that is filling the challenge today, Lord, to give, Lord, of their time, Lord, of their talent, of their treasure, Lord, whatever it is, God, that you would remind them, Lord, and encourage them and affirm them in that decision, Lord. Lord, we love you. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. And everybody here said, amen, amen.